welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me in my uh, dining room in downtown Madrid. Uh, we are still confined here. Uh, it's been a really strange situation, but we're in good spirits. And yeah, I thought this is the place to, to do this tasting. Um, really thrilled to be able to do this. Um, I think I know a few of you guys who are on the list. Um, so as Ben said, please, uh, would love this to be as interactive as we can. Um, I've been in this business for a long time and I know sometimes nothing is more boring than a winemaker talking about his or her wine. So help me to do whatever you guys want to do and then we can actually discuss and, and, and talk and, and, and talk about anything in the, in, in the, about the wine, these wines, other wines, Spain, or whatever. So my name is Andreas, it's a, it's a German name. So apologies for my a German sounding name and, and accent, but I'm really a Spanish winemaker. I have a, a Spanish passport, but I have a German mother and a French father, but I was raised in Spain and have been uh, making wine and selling wine around Spain for uh, now nearly 25 years. So this is really my, my home country, but I learned English in German speaking school. So that's the reason for, so I have a different accent in every language, but um, that's the reason for that. Um, but my, my whole uh, wine career has been in Spain. And yeah, what we are presenting today is, is uh, three wines from my company called Peninsula Wines, uh, which is a, I have like two ways of uh, uh, explaining what Peninsula is. So the, the, the emotional one or the, the beautiful way of, 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 I guess, explaining it, it's a, a bunch of people who have known each other for a very long time who share values and the sense of where the wine world should be heading uh, and we actually got together to build a wine business we always wanted to have it's like building our dream wine company um, and a more technical way of explaining it we are a wine making and vineyard management company so we we manage uh, vineyards and wineries across the country uh, and, and make estate wines in those places and each project each uh, estate has its own philosophy and its own reason to exist and I hope uh, to share this with you um, actually this 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 evening um, Ben just to make sure is, is it okay can you hear me is it working perfect Andreas yeah yeah okay just uh, you, you just helped me and, and you jump in if you you think that I'm, I'm leaving something out. Um, so as I was saying, it's uh, the wine business is, is a beautiful business, but it's also a very old fashioned one sometimes. And it's there are many things which uh, after a couple of decades in it, uh, we felt we could improve. And uh, after all those frustrations of wine not heading where we wanted, we had a dinner in Madrid about six years ago, the three founding, uh, uh, shareholders of Peninsula. Um, my main partner is a gentleman called Jesus, Jesus Cantarero, who is a third generation uh, vine grower in the center of the country in Cuenca, in Castile. And he has a beautiful, beautiful estate, uh, very high elevation in the middle of the country, uh, where his uh, family had been making wine for, for some time. But as the wine business goes, uh, we always talk about family uh, uh, being something good in, in, in the wine business. And often it is, but sometimes it's less good. And this was an example of a company managed by different sisters and brothers-in-law. And my friend Jesus was actually sick of it and said, we really have to change the way we, we go about this business. And uh, we, we noted that we were uh, had the same kind of um, concerns about sustainability and about authenticity. And I, I uh, may explain a little bit what we mean with making wines which have uh, this authentic and this sustainable element to them. And the third uh, man in, in this case on the, on the table was our, our, my other partner, Sam Harrop. Uh, Sam Harrop is another master of wine. Uh, he is from New Zealand, but had uh, uh, worked and uh, lived and for a long time in the UK. He was with uh, Marks and Spencer's actually a winemaker there. I met him maybe 20 years ago, he was my customer. He was a really, really demanding customer. But we became friends back then and always said we should do something together. So that very, uh, I would say, eclectic bunch of people who got together to make wines um, that, that we actually are proud of. And, and uh, we, we, we sum it up 
with it, we say we call it wines worth drinking and it's it's we really mean it it's we try that everything we do every single bottle that leaves uh, my company should be an excellent example of what it is and a really good purchase and we always say we would be proud to take it to our mother's house and to recommend it and i don't care if it's if it's an eight pound bottle of wine 20 bottle of wine or an 80 uh, 80 uh, um, pound bottle of wine it should be great value and a really uh, something worth drinking at any price and we are very self-critical with this and hopefully we'll, you will see it in the glass um, this this evening with these wines and more recently uh, this was about uh, five to six years ago that dinner i mentioned where we founded uh, peninsula and where my partner jesus decided to actually give his estate which is called Fontana, uh, to make Peninsula the managing director, the technical director, the viticulturist, the winemaker, uh, the commercial director, and the financial director of his winery. So that when I said that Peninsula is a winery management company, that's what I mean. We run the whole place from the very basic, from the very beginning from the vineyard to the glass and try to incorporate all the decisions very carefully for each wine. Um, and then more recently, about two years ago, we got a fourth partner on, on board. Uh, he's from Bilbao, it's called Gorka Itagire. So it's like, like a joke now. They say uh, a, a New Zealander, a guy from Bilbao, one from Cuenca and, and, uh, and a half Spaniard, half German uh, for, for myself. So it's a really eclectic kind of people like walking into a bar and making, making wines. But we had worked for a long time to find the right partner to make wines in Rioja which is, as, as I think most of you will know, or all of you will know, is the most prestigious and famous Spanish uh, wine growing region, but which has many elements which we think we can, where we can add something to the region. And uh, we will taste uh, one red wine from that new wine we call Badiola, uh, which is, is the same model as with the Cuenca winery, Fontana Peninsula manages the whole place. Um, and we're just launching those wines and trying to make Wines in Rioja that are conform to those to those values that I was mentioning before, and then under the Peninsula name, uh, we also make wines in a few other spots around the country. Every time we find something which we think is worth uh, showing to the world, uh, every time we found vineyards which we believe are worth preserving and fighting for, especially old vines that are at the risk of being of, of being given up because they have no access to market or they no, have no economic sustainability, then we go in and try to make wines and make them viable. Um, and one example is uh, th those beautiful old vineyards that you have in the Spanish central system. Uh, people sometimes forget how complicated Spain is as a country. It's an extremely diverse country, not just culturally, also geographically and climatically. Uh, it's the second most mountainous country in Europe after Switzerland. It's all about mountains and valleys and altitude. And we have that amazing mountain chain called the, 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 the Sistema Central, which splits the Iberian Peninsula in north and south, roughly. And there's a mountain, the different mountain ranges that form that big range. One is called Sierra de Gredos, which is north of Madrid. And you have those beautiful, beautiful old vines, uh, mainly Garnacha, the Garnacha variety. They are 60, 80, 90, sometimes 100 year old. Uh, vineyards which are being abandoned. So we make wines out of those two and the second wine we are tasting tonight is an example of that, of those projects under the Peninsula name. Um, that's basically in a nutshell. So when we try to, uh, when, we, when we say, when we talk about values and uh, with no, no intention to bore you too much with that, but uh, there are two main ideas behind everything we do. Uh, one is authenticity and I know it's a buzzword everybody talks about authenticity and sometimes it has lost a bit of its meaning but for us it's very important and we have no better word to express what we mean my partner Sam Harp has written a book or co-authored a book called authentic wine with an English gentleman called Jamie Good uh, which I recommend very highly this book it's 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 a few years old it will be re-edited now um, so most things in that book we agree as a company with, and it's, it's a bit like our Bible, at least with 90%. And there it tries to define what authenticity means in, in wine. And for me, it's uh, like the reason to exist of wine is that authenticity. And at the end of the day, what it means is that wine as a, as a beverage, as a drink, has to have a link to a place. It has to be a link 
uh, to a place, to a climate, to a place where it's made, to people who make it. There has to be a cultural dimension to wine. Um, and sometimes it gets forgotten, especially in, produ in producing countries, which have a tradition of having wine as, a, as just part of their daily diet. Uh, uh, people tend to forget that this, that this cultural component in wine is what allows me to actually engage with it at a deeper level. Uh, I want wine not just, of course it has to taste good, uh, and I want gastronomic and, 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 and organoleptic pleasure, it's, that, that's, of course it's a given, but I want to go deeper. I want wine to talk to me on an emotional level, uh, to stimulate me also on an aesthetic level even. Uh, and that deeper relationship is what makes wine so interesting and which is the reason um, I and, and, and my team actually are in this business, the only reason we are in this business, actually to make something that makes life more interesting and, 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 and richer. Um, so we, we, we give it a lot of thought to decide what does authenticity mean at different levels and, and hopefully I can convey to you guys what we think makes these wines authentic at different, at different price levels. And the second main pillar is uh, sustainability. Again, a word which has been, is being abused a lot. Uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding about sustainability in the wine business. Uh, some people think it's a natural product and therefore it has to be sustainable. It's actually not true. It, it is a natural product, but it is actually, there's a lot of, especially cheap wine being produced around the world in an unsustainable way. And because wine is in our views uh, uh, a cultural product, as I mentioned before, and not something you need, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not something of primary necessity, it's completely unacceptable to produce it in a non-sustainable way. So it's like making art or making music destroying the planet. You, 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 won't, you won't be prepared even to spend your money on something which is not sustainable. So there are a lot of questions uh, how to make sustainable and we are among the most active players, uh, certainly in Spain, to try to make sustainability practical and to, to, to see what does it mean in, in, in each uh, of our daily decisions to make wine as sustainable as we possibly can. Um, and there are many, many, many elements to it. Uh, one is that we measure against ourselves because there's a lot of greenwashing about sustainability. There's a lot of lying, a lot of uh, numbers that are really hard to compare, but you can compare yourself against yourself. And I can confidently say that we are a much more sustainable company this year than the year before and last year than the year before that. So we're really progressing every year. We, uh, we are founding members of something called Rhinemis for Climate Protection, uh, which forces, uh, which is a third party certified scheme that forces us to reduce our carbon footprint, our water footprint, our energy efficiency, etc. And actually water is possibly the most important element of all in Spain. And, it's one of the other big uh, lessons we have learned about sustainability in these years. You, uh, sustainability means something different in different places where you make wine. In a dry climate like we have in most of Spain, uh, responsible water use is extremely important. And uh, we have defined this by, uh, maxi by maximizing the yield or defining the maximum yield per hectare uh, we can do and, and to, to be very um, economically very careful in every decision we take uh, from the vineyard to the bottle or to the market to make sure that we fine-tune every decision to make the best possible value. And the first wine we are going to drink uh, to, tonight, Mesta, is the result of all that thinking, saying what is the minimum price uh, for which you can make a sustainable wine? And for us that's Mesta. It's defined by uh, a, a, a production of kilos per hectare in the vineyard, and then a, a number of decisions to make it as ideal as possible. And our conclusion is if you are not happy to pay that money for a bottle of wine, you should actually not be drinking wine. You should be drinking juice or beer or water or any other more industrial product. Um, but we can be um, say happy to say, this is something which is as sustainable as you can be um and we 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 have like predefined this and just to, and to finish the, the introduction and, and maybe one more idea about sustainability uh sustainability has different uh components and there's a very important one which is the economic one yeah there's no environmental sustainability if you don't make your winemaking and your operation economically sustainable. So for instance in the case of the second wine we're going to taste which is from those old vineyards 
in the in the mountains of 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 the Sierra de Gredos, north of Madrid. Uh, we have defined how much money does a grower need to keep those vineyards uh, going uh, for for the next generations. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a costing definition from the beginning, uh, and then we calculate from there and saying how much should this bottle cost to make it viable and to and to and to give those wonderful vineyards also market access. That's, I hope Ben, this is enough as introduction for Peninsula. If you, if you agree, we start tasting. Yeah, fantastic introduction. Um, it's great to hear your passion for sustainability and your other pillars. Um, on the first wine, the Mesta, could you tell us about the idea behind the label for that wine? Yeah, I will be brutally honest. Uh, when, I, when we when we took when we took the, um, the over the management of that place, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, rolling hills, uh, lots of uh, trees, oak trees, oak trees which are 300, 400 years old in the middle of the vineyards. But culturally, there is nothing. I mean, I I, I I drove through the villages and trying to find any cue, anything. What can we put on the label? Uh, and and the reality is the only thing which is really um, uh, it's, it's like calming. It's a, it's a calming place. Uh, the the it's the province is called Cuenca. It's one of the biggest provinces in in Spain. It's about a one hour drive east of Madrid. And uh, uh, to give you an idea, uh, uh, the density of population I think is two point four. Uh, inhabitants per square kilometer, so it's about twice Siberia, uh, but it's still you don't you don't meet a lot of people. The north of the province is too cold for wine growing because it's too high. The south is quite warm, and we are just in the middle. That's a perfect spot to make to make interesting wines. And the only thing you see are sheep. I mean, there's a big tradition of 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 of, of flocks of sheep running around, and uh, uh, it has been always like a, a very famous region uh, for sheep, uh, both for meat. Uh, but also for wool, the, the, the merino, merino uh, sheep. So it was an economic powerhouse in, 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 in the Middle Ages because wool was a very uh, valuable commodity. And the shepherds uh, actually became so powerful, they had a kind of union, like, a, like, a, like an association of shepherds, and it was called Mesta. So the Mesta was an association of shepherds. It was so powerful, they would sit actually vis-a-vis -vis the king of Spain to negotiate uh, about the trading routes and the rights, and, and where the, can the canyadas are like the, 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 the migrating routes for sheep. And they are actually still protected to this day. I mean, they are still, uh, there's the, in, in the Spanish constitution, they protect the canadas like those migrating routes from being built on or being blocked so even if there's a motorway if there's a flock of sheep you have to maybe you have to make an underground uh, pathway or you have to, to to actually they have in theory the right to 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 stop the traffic on a, on a motorway so we thought it was a beautiful idea so we decided to put sheep on the label and because it was sustainable so we have it's like it's like the circle of life you have all those little sheep running around and uh, we thought let's make something very simple and uh, that represents the area and yeah that's that's uh, like a symbol of the, of the area and, and that sustainability idea behind fantastic i love a good backstory to a, a wine yeah and we have, we have a range of that so it's 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 these wines are made in that estate of my partner jesus and then uh, his sisters, who, who the ones that used to run the business, they were bought out in the business. But we made a commitment to keep managing their vineyards and 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 obviously using their grapes and and making them viable. So they have no link in the management. So they have no say in, in how we run the business. But we do use their vineyards. Um, we had they were always organically farmed. Or a big part was organically farmed. And when we joined, we passed the whole. The whole, the, the, all the estates of my partners and his sisters to be organic. So it's now a, it's it's big. It's it's 600 hectares of vineyard. So my partner has 400. The sisters have another 200. So it's probably the biggest, uh, uh, at least quality driven uh, organic vineyard in 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 Spain. Uh, but it's more than organic. It's uh, we have a whole sustainability. Uh, scheme and uh, we call it organic plus because organic just means that you are following the European laws for organic winemaking which are okay uh, but not good enough for, for instance the organic legislation says nothing about irrigation for instance which I mentioned before so you can actually make an organic wine by over cropping uh, which which is ridiculous so it will be organic but not sustainable so we, we, we there's a bit more behind it than just being organic um, but for us, it's very important to, to stress the sustainability of that wine. And it's, it's a white, and it's about time that we, 
to start drinking something. It's getting very dry with my long speech here. Um, and it's made from a well-known and maybe the favorite Spanish grape now, nowadays called Verdejo. Uh, Verdejo has seen a bit of a boom also internationally in the last years. Uh, it's, 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 it's the main quality grape in central Spain, I would say, in, in, in the two Castillas in, in, in Castile. Um, it's, uh, you tell me uh, uh, how, how, how much detail you want. I mean, I'm very happy to go into as much technical uh, details as you guys wish, but maybe send some, give us some input and, and tell Ben how much we should be talking about uh, technical detail or not. I don't want to bore you guys. Um, uh, but Verdejo is a grape that is fairly aromatic. It's, it's, it, it's quite fresh. It's, uh, people sometimes compare it to Sauvignon Blanc. I, I prefer to compare it to Grüner Weltliner, if you know the, the grape, the, the Austrian grape. Uh, it's quite, has a strong, it's quite a zesty, quite, quite a herbal aroma, very lifted um, and, and quite, quite attractive. Um, and obviously it does best, we believe, in, in, in fresh, un-oaked styles. There are some examples with some oak in them, but normally we think they, this, this grape does best when it's, when, it's, uh, when it shows the primary fruit. We want to make something which is very precise, very fresh, and actually made to show that, that primary character. When we say primary character, I mean aromas that come from the grape versus secondary aromas, uh, which is how we call the, the, the aromas that come from winemaking. And then the tertiary aromas would, one, would be the ones that come from aging or the process after the wine is made. So Spain is a fascinating wine country, huge potential, but arguably it has made wines which are a little bit too style driven uh, as opposed to origin driven. And there's been a big tradition that started in Sherry or in Cava or even, even in Rioja where most wines are, the personality of the wine is very much marked by the winemaking or by the aging or by decisions somebody has taken in the winery. So our view is let's maybe focus much more on the vineyards and, and, and on that more primary expression to make wines that are more pure and more expressive of place, if that makes, makes sense. Um, so white wine, Verdejo. I think, I mean, if you, if you just, even without swirling your glass, you can see it's, it's lifted, it's, it's, it's quite aromatic, it's very fresh. If you give it a swirl, it will be more, more intense. Um, I'm not a big friend of, of, of making big lists of aromas. It's a bit of an of a idiotic kind of thing. I mean, you know, the, the, the average human can, it's, 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 it's proven. I mean, you can only distinguish three aromas at a single moment in time in, in your brain. So people who list like 10 or 15 aromas in a glass are either, uh, yeah, having a fantasy or they read it in a book or so. Another thing is that wines open up over time and then actually give you more. But here, it's very... Uh, fresh, it goes into the, the vegetal herbal kind of, of, of aromas. Um, they are uh, I, I also, uh, you know, fennel, I, I like, like, like fresh fennel, these, these kind of things. Yeah, and it's a very, it's a refreshing, very pleasant wine. It's not usually complex. It, it, it's not, it doesn't aim to be hugely complicated or complex. It's a relatively inexpensive wine. It's the most inexpensive wine we make. But we're proud of it because we think for that price, it really shows the typicity of the grape. And when, when I mentioned authenticity before and what authenticity means at different price levels, at that kind of level, it means that it really shows the grape personality and maybe the wider area. So you, you, that freshness that it has is a consequence of the altitude. Those vineyards are at 800 to 900 meters high. So it's a perfect place to make that sort of wine. But it's not a wine that expresses a, a, a small terroir uh, like you would have in a more upmarket wine because it's not, it doesn't aim to, to, to do that. It's, it, it just should give pleasure, but be a very good example of its kind. And once you got, when you, when you try to buy, when you compare this to other Verdejos, in the market, some cheaper, you quickly find that others are just drinkable, neutral wines. I mean, they, they are, they're okay, they're technically well made, but they don't even show the personality of the grape sometimes. And that, it's when, when in our view, it starts being non-authentic. So that's, these are the kind of things we measure 
uh, ourselves against when we when we think are we doing a good job or, or not uh, because we are here in my in my dining room i thought we should actually have something to eat with this so i'm, I'm I, I actually do have a few tapas for you <laughs> i can't share them but um i just picked some things from the kitchen the first thing i have is cockles i don't know if you i mean you know spain has a we have a huge um, love for canned seafood. So I'm actually not sure if you can, maybe I can show you like this, I'll actually, I'll show you a cockle. Uh, they are called berberechos in Spanish. So there are these, these little cockles, uh, which are actually in, just preserved in salt water. And they're beautiful, they're, 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 of course they are salty, but they also have fresh, they have very nice texture. You put some lemon in them, and that would be the typical aperitivo you have in a bar. I mean, if you go into Madrid, you now bars are opening up finally in Madrid. I mean, we have a beautiful day, so terraces are open. So you would actually go, many people would go into a bar and say, give me a verdejo. And they would just order the, 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 the grape. And then Mesta would be a good, good example for that. So next time we do this, I will send you some food with the, with the wines too. Ben, any comments? Or should we? I'm, I'm very on? jealous. I'm very jealous of the cockles. Um, so why, why do um, they make such a good pairing for the Videcco? Well, um, uh, who knows? Who knows? I think um, there, there, is, um, there is a certain, you know, there's a, that dangerous word minerality in wine. It's, uh, everybody talks about minerality these days. But I actually, we use it. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very valid term. But we use it, uh, we never use minerality as a term for on the nose, on, on the aroma. We use minerality, just a convention we have made for ourselves, but we use minerality as a sensation on the palate. So it's like that saline tension on the, on the end of the palate that adds to the complexity and the length of a wine. And our wines are mineral, they have a mineral element, even at this price level. Actually, if we, the higher we go, the easier it becomes, or the, the more mineral are those wines. So you could actually say, it makes sense if you have a uh, seafood which has uh, like that saline tension and you have like those those uh, 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 briny kind of aromas in the shellfish it's like a perfect match to that dry fresh wine that cleans the palate but then like adds that minerality to it so it just works i i i, I can't explain it more scientifically i agree it just works really well um, you'll probably go on to this more in the the next two wines but you um, briefly touched on altitude um, what uh, effect does altitude have on a wine? It's hugely important in, in a warm climate. Uh, so uh, maybe the, 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 the difficulty maybe about those terms in the wine world is that everything depends on a context. Um, so we, you can't say the higher the altitude, the better the wine. You can't, as you can't say, the older the wine, the better the wine. There are many, there are many of those half truths and myths that sometimes we have to, to debunk. But once you have, you get into latitudes where it gets warm and where you have no lack of sunshine and where you have no lack of the potential of ripening the grapes, then actually altitude compensates for that latitude. So in a warm, in a relatively warm uh, latitude like Spain, altitude compensates and makes for really cold climates. Uh, so I, I was mentioning that that, that province of Cuenca, uh, uh, that's in, 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 in the province is, or the, the autonomic region is Castilla-La Mancha, but we are actually not in La Mancha, we are in the Castilian part of that region. So people say, oh no, you're in La Mancha. No, we are not. We are two hours north of La Mancha. We are 200 meters higher, which means that our, our, our grapes ripen two weeks later. Uh, and we have a completely different uh, chemical structure naturally in those grapes that ends up in the wine. So it's much easier to preserve natural acidity because of that higher altitude. So there's no way you could make this wine 200 or, or 300 kilometers south of where we are in the same province, because at 200 meters less altitude, the wine just gets flabby. They, 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 they can make uh, powerful red wines, maybe of, of Monastrel or Garnacha or those kind of grapes. Um, but you need to adapt. You have to find the spot where your grape is best adapted to your growing conditions. And altitude plays a big role in modulating that. Makes sense. Um, I'll let you move on to the next wine now. Thank you. Yeah. So the next wine will be one of those, our little pet projects, uh, which we do under the peninsula name. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the Fontana wines are, are signed by Fontana, the winery, and the Badiola wines in Rioja are signed by Badiola. But then we have our 
our projects which we make around the country, which we actually sign because a team behind is is maybe more important than the than the, than the winery or the or the specific vineyard. Um, so we were uh, about five years ago. We went on a on an exploratory tour. Uh, my partner Sam Harp and our our head winemaker Tao Platon. Uh, we went to drive around those old vineyards uh, because we loved some of the wines that were being made in that area. It has become fashionable in the last, I would say, 10 to 12 years. There was a new generation of very fresh, very drinkable, beautiful light garnachas from high altitude vineyards. And honestly, I thought that the pioneers, there are a couple of companies and, and, and winemakers there who had introduced or rediscovered that area. So we really thought that they had more or less um, say, seized the vineyards that existed. And our enormous surprise was that it's not the case. Now, there are hundreds of hectares of, 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 centen, of, 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 of a century old vineyards that are on the limit of being abandoned because those pioneers make a few beautiful wines, but they're so tiny that they haven't been relevant from a social point of view for the area. So they haven't contributed to the economic sustainability of those beautiful vineyards um, because they are these vineyards, once they are 80, 90 years old, they produce maybe 2,000 kilos per hectare, but they're expensive. And those vineyards, those, the, the, they, 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 those grapes, they just don't have a route to market to actually justify or, or to, 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 to make uh, it worthwhile to, to, to cultivate them as they should. So we found a few of those amazing vineyards. We, we looked for, the, for the, the, the grower and typically it was like a man in his, in his early, uh, late 60s, early 70s, cultivating a few patches of land. And we would ask them, what do you do with those beautiful grapes? Uh, not much. I mean, we, 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 I ship them to the co-op, the local cooperative. And then how much do they pay you? And he goes, yeah, 60 cents, 60 euro cents a kilo. And later we found out he was lying. He was getting 40 cents. So his lie was going from 40 to 60 cents. So we analyzed the whole thing and we told him, you know what? I'm paying you one euro 50 per kilo. And the guy gave me a hug. And, and, but first he didn't believe it, but then we said, okay, if we, let's, let's really do that. Because one euro 50 per kilo of grapes of one of those beautiful, beautiful vineyards, if you look at it in the international context, it's not expensive at all. I mean, it's, it's a very, very good price if you compare to any, any other uh, leading um, uh, growing area around the world. You just have to make wines that are actually that translated and, 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 and that in, in a certain way uh, create that connection, allowing you to pay that price for the grapes. And then we looked for some space in some local wineries. We invested some money to, to clean them up. And we have now been making those garnachas from those parcels for uh, four years about. And what we have here is Cadalso, uh, 2018. So if you pour it, the first thing you will hopefully see is that this is a light colored wine. Um, by the way, I think that color is hugely overrated in tastings. Uh, if there's something I would, I mean, color can be nice and it's nice to look at the wine, but all that idea that you have to look at the wine and then you have to smell it and then you, I, I actually favor a bit more a, a global approach uh, like like interact with the wine in a more yeah using all your senses at the same time um but this is clearly a, a light red wine um and it makes sense because garnacha the grape this is 100 percent garnacha is not a, a thick skinned grape and and garnacha uh, shouldn't normally have a really deep color. Some garnachas do have a deep color because they blend in other varieties or because they use uh, another variety in Spain called Alicante Boucher, which is garnacha tintorera, and it's absolutely totally legal in Spain to sell them as garnacha. So this is garnacha tinta, that's the real thing. Uh, from high altitude vineyards, when I say high altitude, again, it starts at about 740, goes up to 900 something. Over 900 gets too cold. Um, and it's an example of that Spain being a complicated place I mentioned before. Uh, people tend to forget it or people don't know it. We, have, we are very lucky in this country for all the tourism we get, but the tourism tends to be on the coast and on the islands. So people get that image of Spain, which is a bit like simplistic of that warm uh, place. Uh, but I can promise you, if I take you in April to those vineyards, you will be freezing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cold climate because of the altitude and also the continentality of it. Um, so what it shows, hopefully, I mean, uh, if nothing else, 
uh, it shows the diversity of Spain and that Spain has the capacity of making styles which are very fresh and drinkable and lighter. So just by looking at the color, you can already see that. And then again, if you smell it, just by smelling it, you will see it's a really pretty, beautiful, lifted wine. I, I, I like that term prettiness. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful wine. Uh, beauty in, 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 in the broader sense because the, the aroma is like sweet, it's like, it's like delicate, it's, there's a floral element to it. So it's not, it's, 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 it's a wine that talks to you, it doesn't shout at you. It, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a well-behaved wine and that makes it much more gastronomic and it makes it also more, more enjoyable. And I think as, as you, we have all of our personal wine journeys as we, as we, as we drink ourselves through our lives and I guess we have like ups and downs, but there is a certain tendency as you get more experience and you drink more, maybe to favor more light, more elegant, more transparent styles that, that actually are less invasive on the palate, um, which doesn't mean that they're necessarily better than more, more full-bodied or more powerful styles, but it definitely helps to give the wines that sense of place and that authenticity I was mentioning at the beginning, if you make wines which are on the lighter side, it's, it's easier to have it communicate, to, to, to speak to you beyond the winemaking technique. And, and this, I, I hope, hope this, is an, this is an example. So it's a pure garnacha from really old vines on granite soil on that, uh, in the, on that mountain chain. These are little parcels of vineyards surrounded by oak trees and chestnut trees. So it's not like a big vineyard, like the opposite to the Mesta vineyard. It's like really small parcels. And we vinify them in concrete tanks. Uh, uh, which is uh, so. If you're if you're interested in that, we can we can go more into more detail. But there's an interesting evolution in the wine world in the last years of actually going choosing the material in which you ferment the must, depending on what you're trying to achieve, and also depending on the variety. Uh, and garnacha for some reason, works extremely well in granite. Uh, so we use granite tanks uh, and we ferment it and there's no oak whatsoever. We want a very pure uh, expression of that, again, primary aromas of that garnacha. Um, and we want to show that Spain can make fine, elegant wines that age well in bottle without any need of, of oak. We've got a question from one of the attendees. Um, it's about the Grenache Garnacha grape. Uh, would you say it is similar to um, Grenache coming out of South Africa at the minute, um, particularly Swartland? Actually, South Africa is the country I know less about of all the wine countries in the world. I mean, I, you know, as in, my, in my journey to become a master of wine, you have to, you have to choose what you cannot see everything. And, and I, I, I need to go to South Africa, but I've never been, and that's one of the places, I, I love some of the wines, but it's one of my big uh, lacking parts which I have to, to work on. Um, I have had, there's a new generation of garnachas, an old wine garnacha from South Africa that are very much in that style. Uh, they get nearly, dare I say, Pinot Noir-like in, in, in their structure, not so much in their, in their aroma. Um, but in that, in that sense, yes. But I don't really know how they make, what else goes into those wines. I mean, if you look at, there, there's a lot of garnachas in California or in Australia, and in fact, where you actually have quite a bit of blending going in, and also feed blends, and you don't know exactly what, what is in those vineyards. And there's a, like all that mixture of other varieties, or you get those, those Rhone mixtures. Uh, so it's, 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 but, uh, it is, it, is, it is reasonable to assume that the really old garnachas in Spain are very similar genetically than those old garnacha plantings in other places, like in Sardinia, for instance, uh, where you have Cananao, which, is, which was Spanish, so it was, and it's also uh, assumable that th those first cuttings that went to, came into the new world were presumably from a Spanish origin because it's a Spanish, a Spanish, Spanish grape. Um, and the same person's all um, interested in both of the uh, wines from Badiola. Um, he really likes them and is wondering if there's any more wines that will be coming from Badiola soon. Okay, yeah, we haven't tasted Badiola yet here, but uh, oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, Badiola, we just, you mean Badiola or Peninsula? Should, should we, well, let's taste this one too. I mean, um, 
the, 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 the garnacha is a peninsula wine, so it's, 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 it's not made at the Badiola winery. Um, it's one of our village wines. It's called Cadalso. Uh, I haven't shown the, the label, by the way. Uh, so it's Peninsula Vinicultores. Cadalso is the name of the village. So what we are trying to do there is actually codify or work out what village character those villages have, because it hasn't been done until now. Most of the winemakers, or all of the winemakers in that region, the handful of quality winemakers, they just make wine where they happen to be, because they just had the vineyards there. So what we are trying is to show the differences between Cadalso and Febreros, which is another village. So we, are, uh, we, are, we launched those in parallel, and it's actually a fascinating exercise to taste in the same vintage Cadalso and Febreros. So you have the same variety, uh, really old vines in two villages, which are just 40 kilometers uh, away, both on granite, and they taste completely differently, even though we make them the same way, way. So there is a village character, and that village character shines through year after year, and we are very, really happy with, with, uh, with this happening. Um, and then our third wine, and we kind of go back to this later, is actually we, Badiola. So that's uh, Las Parcelas, which means the parcels, and Badiola is our Rioja winery. So now we are moving, uh, first we were like one hour east of Madrid in Cuenca, then we were like uh, 45 minutes north uh, west of Madrid in the Sierra de Gredos. Now we are three hours uh, north east in Rioja Alavesa. Um, and here the project, people ask me, hey, why another Rioja winery? And we, we thought very hard about this, but we think that's a fascinating, fascinating uh, moment in time for Rioja as the leading uh, wine production area of Spain. Uh, it's, it's the, the, the wines are beautiful. There are many, many uh, classic wines. But again, uh, if we are honest, they are mostly wines of style. So even the most beautiful classical wines, be it, I don't know, Tondonia, Prado Enea, all these really, really famous wines, they are beautiful, they're beautifully complex because they are made in a beautiful art in artisanal way. They're aged for a very long time and their complexity derives, comes from that winemaking method which has been like cultivated for many, many years. Um, but Rioja is a big place and is also a complicated place. It has many different uh, uh, regions and there's Rioja Alavesa, which is the Basque part of Rioja, which is the northern bit of Rioja. Uh, it's about 20% of Rioja and it's the only part which is north of the Ebro River. So it's a part which is closest to the Sierra Cantabria, again mountains, like the mountain chain that separates Rioja from the Cantabrian Sea influence. And there you have uh, the highest concentration of old vineyards in Rioja. Basically everything is old vines. Um, uh, when I say old vines, I mean 50 years plus but many, many vineyards planted in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. And those vineyards which produce only 50% of the yield of some vineyards in other parts of Rioja, Rioja Baja, or Rioja Oriental, as it's called now, they really, they're not being, uh, the, the people know about that quality, but they're being bought by big wineries, those, those grapes, and they're being blended into making a branded Rioja wine. So uh, Rioja has been a, a beautiful success story, in the 20th century, but very much on the back of an industrial sense, industrial in the good sense of the word, an industrial perspective of making wines that reflect a brand and like a, like, like a winemaking style. And we believe it's about time to try to work on that terroir expression of Rioja. And the place to do that is Rioja Alavesa for us, no doubt about it, because of the altitude, because of the limestone, because Rioja La Vesa, those vineyards in the north are the only parts of Rioja that are on limestone, and limestone has a certain number of advantages, especially for making fine, elegant wines which are age worthy. And maybe most importantly, because you have all those little parcels of vineyards that have been planted between 1910 and, and between 1900 and 1960. Uh, so they, just after Philoxera uh, destroyed the whole vineyards of Rioja, they were replanted and haven't been touched much since then. So we have a huge amount of old vines. And the, the value of the old vines is not just because they are old and lower yielding, it's also because the genetic material in those vineyards is so valuable. Because these vineyards were planted before the high yielding clones uh, of vineyard came into the market. If you plant a vineyard these days, you select a clone. Uh, but these clones are selected for producing 
quantity, not so much quality. Uh, now, now this is slow, slowly changing. But we have that amazing genetic variety in Rioja La Vesa. So we want to contribute in, in putting Rioja La Vesa on the map for terroir driven uh, Riojas. That's basically the, the, the philosophy. Uh, we got our partner Gorka Itagire from the best country on board, found a beautiful uh, spot uh, where we bought a, a, an existing winery, which is quite crappy actually. We, have, we are reforming, we had to clean it up and now we are actually reforming it and building a new winery. But the, the, the beauty of that winery was it came with 300 parcels of vineyards. 300 parcels which on average are 0.3 hectares, so really tiny, beautiful passes, and the whole range from ownership to lease to long-term contracts to, to informal contract, which are as good as the ownership because the people have been uh, uh, bringing those grapes to the winery for, for 20 years. So we have that amazing, amazing potential there. And we're just starting to understand those passes and to make wines. And we want to make parcel wines one day, once we have the winery ready and we understand the passes. We are making village wines, uh, as we are doing in Sierra de Gredos. And we are doing uh, Las Parcelas, which is the one we have here in the glass, and one wine below that called Tempranillo de Laderas. Laderas are the hillside, so a hillside Tempranillo and the hilltop Viura, which is the white grape we do there. So uh, to answer the question, yes, we are launching as we speak uh, uh, two whites and two, uh, two whites in, in, in one level below this, which is Viura de Cabezadas Tempranillo Laderas. We have Las Parcelas white and red. Uh, the white is stunning actually. It's, it's a much smaller production, but we're actually changing hopefully the perception people have of the Viura grape because Viura is really interesting when you have those really old old vineyards on limestone. And we are launching now, as we really in this, in this month, the three first village wines from Villa Buena, Leza, and La Guardia. So for the tasting, um, this is Tempranillo, and uh, uh, this is uh, the place, you could claim that one of the biggest mistakes Spain has made, technically speaking, is to plant Tempranillo in too many places and in places which are not well adapted in terms of altitude, in terms of climate. So there's a lot of uninteresting Tempranillo coming out of too warm regions of Spain. But if there's one part which is the, the, the ground zero of the best Tempranillo of Spain and the world, it's Rioja La Vesa. Uh, we could discuss if Rivera del Duero uh, can co-compete but probably not i think the the, the top uh, the top uh, um, riberas have often some some other varieties in them so it's something to to discuss i think the most beautiful most most uh, uh, expressive and most age-worthy tempranillos come from alavesa and this wine tries to show that it wants to be very very alavesa it's called las parcelas because it comes the, the wine is made with all those little passes so the passes that do not go into the village wines, go into this, into this wine. Um, it's, it's, it's a tiny little bit reduced, you know, uh, there is that conception of reduction, uh, which is the opposite of oxidation in wine. So wine, after all, has been hit, has been uh, uh, yeah, restricted to that bottle for some time. So sometimes you have to give it a little bit of air. And it's also a guarantee of its, of its evolution. Um, I, I'm, this is, uh, when you get your nose, you see it's a bit close. It's not as expressive as it could be. When you now give it a thrill, give it some time, and you will see how it grows and how it opens up in the glass, which is another quality factor in my, in my, in my view. Um, so this, this will definitely benefit from some, some air. Oh, I forgot to, to, to give you some food with the second wine, by the way. Should we do this, Ben, first? Yes, yes. Um, so I have... Um, for the second wine, uh, you know, we always talk about jamón and jamón ibérico in Spain. Everybody knows that. But we do more. Spain, as I said, is a complicated place. And we have another thing called cecina. So cecina is beef. Uh, it's, 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 it's actually uh, uh, it's air-dried uh, beef, um, cured beef. Uh, it's the, 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 the most famous place where this is done is León. Uh, so like the, the, the northwestern part of Castilla León. Um, and there is that amazing uh, meat restaurant there called El Cabricho. Uh, if, you, if you are interested, and I guess most of you guys will be interested in food, um, uh, there is a Netflix documentary about the best 
meet in the world and there's like that countdown like the 10 best meat places in the world from 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 american steakhouses to uh, uh japanese uh, wagyu beef argentina and the number one spot is this place in leon called el capricho and this is cecina from el capricho from that that restaurant just look how marbled it is i mean it's, it's just amazing it has an amazing beautiful fat in it it's super super aromatic it it lasts forever yeah. It's one of the most beautiful dried meats you can get in the world. And it really needs some freshness and some, some, some lighter wine. And I think it's a perfect, perfect match for those lighter yeah, nacha styles that we are making in, in some parts of Spain these days. Also with menthia. You know, menthia is another really interesting grape, uh, which is from, from, from that area, from Leon and some parts of, of Galicia. So, Funnily, sometimes wine goes well with the food of its places. So Cecina goes extremely well with Menthia, but also with those fresh Garnachas. Did you know about um, Cecina, Ben? Or is it something that in the UK, is, is, it, is it a household name or not? I, I hadn't heard of it, but it's not to say it isn't a household name. Um, no, I, I, I haven't heard of it, though. I'll definitely find out though, more about it after this. Um, we've got a couple of quick questions from um, the attendees. Um, how long do you think it will take to change people's opinions of terroir instead of ageing in Rioja? That, that's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. We think the time is ripe for it because there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an uh, understanding of that cultural dimension of wine in more and more places. So I think I have, um, it's, a, it's a right moment to do it. Um, we are hoping it will be strong enough to dedicate our whole winery only to make the terroir driven styles. But because we have to also run a successful business, we are also equipping ourselves to be able to make Crianza and Reserva in the more traditional, not, not necessarily traditional style, but in the following the rules of aging. Um, it's early days, but I have to tell you, I mean, I've been doing now, maybe I've done 15 or 20 masterclasses in Spain uh, to like mixed audiences, lots of sommeliers. And our surprise is that people immediately get it. Uh, because I was afraid that people would say, oh, why not a Rioja? And, and I was actually really, really anxious about the idea. Oh, these people have been making nice wines in Cuenca and in Gredos. Now they're coming to Rioja because everybody goes to Rioja. And we want really to fight that idea. No, we have a real reason. We have been thinking for six years uh, to find the perfect spot to do something very specific. And people immediately understand it. Um, and, and we are not alone, I have to say. That. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of, 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 of producers, but they're smallish. And I, I think we can really contribute to that. Um, and we want to do it in a positive way because there has been a bit of a fighting against those things that, that we have a lot of trouble with the regulation in, 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 in Rioja. Everything is outlawed. I mean, you, you, they're really, really tough. And because they're trying to protect what they say is a typicity, but that typicity is so much cellar driven, not, not terroir driven. So we are trying to move, shift that conversation to saying, no, we are not opposing the classic wines. We want to put a parallel quality pyramid on the side. And those classical wines where the quality is defined by its aging time is still relevant. So keep it, but give Rioja the chance to also express terroir because it's one of the greatest terroirs in the world. Uh, and it's not being shown in the glass so it's it's we really have i think as wine people we we have a i would say we have an ethical responsibility to actually give those vineyards access to the market because they will disappear i mean there's no way uh, the, the 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 market pays for a beautiful beautiful 80 year old vineyard in rioja la vesa uh, uh, maybe 25 percent more per kilo than a cheap mass-produced rioja uh, tempranillo from rioja baja but it only, only produces 50%. So you need to pay twice the price to make it uh, reasonable. Uh, so, and, and, and the fun thing is that it doesn't translate into double the price of the bottle, just a little bit. If you pay a couple of pounds more, you get immediately a much, much better wine and you immediately have a wine which, is, uh, which can be sustainable. So these, these ideas of how do we communicate in a positive way, guys, just trade up for one two pounds and it's a different world uh, and that's what we're trying to trying to do how long will it take i don't know i, I hope to see it i mean um i have 
I've put myself out there with my, I mean, I have a fantastic team. I mean, we have a really, really strong uh, team. And I've declared to my team and openly, uh, our aim is to make one of the top, top Riojas or one of the best wines in this country in the next, I don't care if it's five, six or seven years. When I say best, best for us and for our partners, uh, for you guys, when you say, hey, okay, we are really up there among the best wines. I don't care about Parker points, but I want, I want Tim Atkin and these people to, to see it. Uh, but uh, I want to be among the top. And why do we want that? Because we have some of the best, most beautiful vineyards in the world and in Rioja. We have a fantastic team of people and we are making a great winery which has zero expense. We're not spending any money in expensive architecture. We're not spending any, not one euro in anything that doesn't make the wine more authentic or more sustainable. But any money we need to control the process, it will be a perfect winery. Uh, but no, not a show winery. And with all those elements, if we don't make some of the best wines of Rioja in six, seven, eight years, it will be a failure. So it will be a personal failure for me. So that, that's, that's, that's the ambition. And if we do that, I think people will recognize it because our experience is that when you put things which really show in the glass what you are telling, then it, it works and it works all over the world. What doesn't work, work is if you, if you make some empty marketing speak and saying, oh, this is a village wine, but then you put your nose in it and you taste it and all the villages taste the same, then you have a problem. But if we can, if we manage to get that character into the glass and people can relate to the origin, and then I think we have a winner. I agree. And yeah, once people taste for wines, then they'll, they'll be a self difference. Yeah. And um, that's changed already. Eh? No, no, that has yeah. opened up already. Yeah. Uh, we've got a few questions as well about the um, aging potential. Um, do you think 100% Garnacha wines are capable of aging? And both wines, do they have good aging potential? It's, I think yes, um, but it's also true we, are, we, have been, we have four years experience. So the first vintages are actually beautiful and, they're, and they are evolving in a really nice way in the bottle. Um, and uh, actually... Uh, they are, they are growing more. The drinking window is wider than we thought it would be when we started. Uh, the key is the backbone of the wine, which in this case is the acidity. Uh, you have, actually, you have some, uh, Cadalso is the less tannic of our garnachas. If we had Cebreros here as a comparison, Cebreros has, is a much more muscular, has a more, has a more, uh, has nice, beautiful, grainy tannins, but give it even more of a backbone. So probably Cebreros will have more of an aging potential than Cadalso, uh, but so far uh, there is freshness enough. Having said that, uh, the top, top garnachas from Gredos, which are famous and which are really expensive, they are disappointing a bit, uh, and that's my personal view, but we have been tasting quite a few of them, and some of them are just falling off a cliff, and they're just, just not keeping up to their promise. And that's a huge problem. I mean, if you put wines out there at the price of a Burgundy Premier Cru or even Grand Cru, you better make a wine that can age. And if you, if you are aiming at that market, and then if somebody goes down in his cellar and, or her cellar and opens a bottle of that and it's oxidized after 10 years, then you are really hurting uh, the area. But these wines are not usually expensive. And so what we are, we are trying to buy, build the house from the foundation and not from the top down. And once we find nice little parcels, we might actually do wines which are worth maybe twice that price, but not four times that price. And then we will see, uh, uh, so the aging potential will have, to, will have to be aligned also with the ambition of the wine and the, and, and the price. So the answer is yes, but not all of them. Sorry, can I, can I mute myself? Perfect. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, that's all we've got time for. So thank you very much. It's been very insightful to hear all about um, the wineries and the wines. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been watching. Hope yeah. you enjoyed it. Let me just show you, show you the Manchego cheese I have for the Rioja. Um, that's a real thing. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, you know, look how it crumbles. I mean, it's beautiful. 100% cheap. So we're we actually, I'm taking a, a, a cheese from close of the Mesta wine with the Rioja. And it, it, really, it really works. And, and, and yeah, give this wine some time. Um, and it will open up as you, as you, um, yeah, let it breathe. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andreas. You're more than welcome. Thanks for having me.